today, we see the hashpah of Hasidus in the world has spread, that even those that are not Hasidim are actually following the same thing that these two criticize, and they're doing the same kind of things that Hasidim do. And one of them is also this, visiting the Rebbe, not in the same way that Hasidim, not on that same scale, but they also make a point to come see the Rebbe during Yantu. And the basis for that is because there's a mitzvah for Yidin to come and, and, and visit the Beis HaMikdash. So the question is, you need to understand, what does it mean you come to the Beis HaMikdash to be seen by the Abishta? I, the Abishta needs me to come to Yerushalayim He's talking back to me. No. The question is, um, maybe she doesn't need me to come there. You see, we know in Perky Obis it says, that there are three things. I mentioned this when we spoke at uh, at the um, dorm, the Tzor Shabbos, the other night. That it says in Pirkei Avos, if you think about three things, if you remember them, you'll never do an avera. What are the three things? There's an eye that always sees, and there's an ear that always hears, and everything you do is recorded in a book. It's a metaphoric way of saying that Hashem sees everything you do, He hears everything you say, and nothing ever gets forgotten, that term remembers it forever. And therefore, that if I am aware of that, it'll it'll prevent me from doing an Avera. And here we're saying to be seen by the Abishter, you have to go to the base of Mikdash, you have to travel to a specific place, to his house, for him to see me. The second thing is, the Gemara says, that's number two on the sheet on page 30, Kishem Shabo Lirois, Karbo Lirois. Even though the Chumash it says you go to the base Mikdash to be seen, but just like they went to be seen, they also went to see as well. What do they see? Hashem sees us. What does it mean we see him? You don't see Hashem. What does that mean? <clears throat> so there's a bigger question here is. That even though we understand how important it is to go to a Beis Hamikdash, a very holy place, but if we if we begin to think about what it involved and how much time was spent on this on this journey to go to the Beis Hamikdash, especially three times a year, it's really shocking to think that this is where most of the time, so much time was spent, was just on traveling. Even today, when people go to the Rebbe, one of the criticisms are. Let's say you live in a different country, especially traveling from Israel to the Rebbe. So before you travel, you, know, you have to spend time getting ready for your trip. Then you go on the trip. Then you spend time here, and you don't only have to. You don't have your own place where to be. And then you spend time, and then you go back. All this time, if you could have learned, used this time, talking about men especially to learn more Torah and to grow. Of course, being by your Rebbe is a nice thing, but isn't it more important to spend, I mean, these are talking about hours and hours and hours of time that you could have spent for Torah. But the same question comes up with the Beis HaMikdash. Going to the Beis HaMikdash, they had to travel. And in those days, they traveled by foot because that was the mitzvah. And that's why it's called Aliyah the Regal. Aliyah the Regal means to ascend to Yerushalayim by foot. And this is not just like a sort of an additional good thing to do. The halach is if someone chas v'shalom can't walk to the base of Megdash, they're exempt from the mitzvah. So if God forbid a person has a problem that he can't walk, crippled, even though he could be sitting in a wagon and go to the base of Megdash, and he would probably get reward for doing it, but there's no longer an obligation because physically he can't walk. So he had a dafka walk. If you walk, it takes longer. Also, if you walk, you can say that while you're walking, you're, you're studying Torah. You could study when you're traveling, but you can't concentrate the same way. So whether it took them a week to travel, it took them more time to travel, there's so much time being lost. And especially the Gemara says that those people who lived the furthest, it took them two weeks to get to the base of English. It took them two weeks to get back which means when they traveled for Sukkot, they spent five weeks 
Today you take an airplane, you eat breakfast in Israel, and you can eat supper in America. But uh, but in those days, it was uh, two weeks travel. Imagine to Yerushalayim, two weeks back, and they spent a week in Yerushalayim. And that was Sukkot. A few months later, it comes Pesach. Okay, pack your bags. We get ready. We travel two weeks to the Beis HaMikdash, two weeks back, and we spend a week in the Beis HaMikdash for Pesach. And then when it comes to Shavuos, which is only seven weeks later, we're packing our bags again. We're packing our bags again. So you make a cheshmer for certain people, those that, let's say, live the furthest, they used to travel approximately 12, 13, 14 weeks a year in traveling. Not everybody lived so far away, so for some people, it was less time. So it's 10 weeks, so it's eight weeks, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous amount of time and you do this for your whole life, which means you're spending so many, in 10 years, you spend 80 weeks on the road. And in 20 years, you spend 160 weeks on the road. I mean, think of it, the amount, the enormous amount of time that gets spent just for traveling. So it must be that there's something so extremely urgent in traveling to the base of Middash that, that it was worth it to lose all this time and everything we can benefit from that time in order to be in the base of Middash. I don't remember. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> so what is it? So these are the two things. One thing is to be seen by Hashem. And the other thing is that we should see Hashem. So what does that mean? So the answer is, the base of Migdash, we know we say this is Hashem's home, and we know what it says, you know, if you look in the Chumash, it says, build a base of Migdash, build a sanctuary, and I will dwell there. <laughs> and we know that dwell there, what does that mean? That Ibish is everywhere. Dwell there means that this is where Hashem is revealed. In other words, there's no place in the world that Hashem is so revealed, so his galus, like he is in the base of Migdash. That's where it's revealed in the strongest way. Not just a little bit more, but in a way that's beyond, you can't compare it. It's, not, it's an unparalleled thing. There's nothing in the world, no place in the world where Hashem's presence is so revealed in an open way, like in the base of English. And not only that, but the base of English is also considered the head and the heart of the universe, which means just like in the human body, in many places, we find that the Chazal, our sages, draw a parallel between the Neshama and the Guf, and Hashem and the world. Just like the Neshama gives life to the Guf, Hashem gives life to the universe. So when the Neshama gives life to the Guf, it's like Hashem, the Neshama is everywhere. If someone would ask a person, where in my body is the Neshama? The answer is in my head, in my heart, in my arms, in my legs, in my toes, in my nose. It's everywhere. Every part of my body that's Baruch Hashem alive has the Neshama in it. But nevertheless, there are these two organs that that's where the Neshama connects initially. And from there, it spread, spreads to the entire body. Yeah. Does this, the analogy of the universe, does that also connect with the idea of the beneficial peace of the Or is it just that one area? A little bit different, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the, 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 the neshama, first, that's why these organs are so vital. And chas v'shalom, if these organs wouldn't be functioning properly, the whole body shuts down, God forbid. And this is, in fact, the reason uh, why we can make the comparison. Hashem Shechin is all over the world. There isn't one, one spot in the world one even fraction of an inch in the world that does not have Hashem's presence there. In the deepest depth of the earth, in the highest point out in space, in, in the furthest places in space, Hashem's presence is there. But how is Hashem's presence reach all these places? It's through the Beis HaMikdash, which means initially it's in the head and the heart, the Beis HaMikdash. From there, it spreads to the whole world. So really, if God forbid the head and the heart of God forbid no longer there, then the whole body can't live. There's no base in English anymore. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the reason why the world still exists and why there's still godliness in the world is because even though it was physically destroyed, 
Nevertheless, Hashem Shechin is still connected to that place, and from there it still spreads to the rest of the world. And there's a certain aspect, as it would be more like a head and a heart that was injured or damaged, rather a head and a heart that was eliminated. So as a result of this, the whole world is in a state where it's, it's not the same as it used to be. And the mushroom that's using chassidus is actually also from Gemara. It says that sleep is another mushroom for Golis. When it says in Tilim, for example, Hashem, why are you sleeping? How could you say such words? Actually, in the Tilim of the Rebbe's capital, what do we say? Lo yonum v'lo yishon, Hashem doesn't sleep. But there are other places in Tilim where we're saying, Hashem, wake up, take us out of Golis. Why are we compare Golis to sleeping? When a person sleeps, they're alive, but they're unconscious. So in the times of the Beis Mignish, Hashem's presence was revealed in the world. The neshama of the world was conscious. Everybody was naturally aware of Hashem's presence. Everyone felt Hashem's presence. And as a result of that, everybody naturally felt love and fear of Hashem. Everyone felt and understood godliness on their level. But it was, it was a, just like the difference between a person who was awake and conscious and a person who was unconscious, God forbid. That's the difference between the times of the Beis Mignish and now. Now we're conscious of Hashem's presence. Then they were conscious of Hashem's presence. And therefore, it brought all these results of love and fear, serving Hashem in this amazing way. And now, in Godless, we're not. So in those days, not only that the Beis Migdash had a big influence on the world, but by going to the Beis Migdash physically, which is the source of this awareness of this consciousness, when we came back home after the Beis Migdash, this upgraded everything in our lives, our davening, our learning, our mitzvahs, our Abbas Yisrael, our tshuva, everything we did was on a much higher level because we just gained a higher level of consciousness of Hashem. And we did it three times a year. Which means that whatever we gained on Sukkot, it doesn't mean it, it faded away, we had to uh, sort of refresh it again on, on Pesach. Pesach was on a higher level, Shavuos was another level, and that's how we advanced from Yontav to Yontav, from year to year, constantly upgrading our level and degree of consciousness of Hashem. And this is something which is impossible for a person to have only because of the base of English. And how was it? Because the base of English is where Hashem's presence is revealed. So when it says in Gemara that we go to the base of English to see Hashem, it doesn't mean that you walk in there, you actually see Hashem, but you do see godliness. How is that? What does it mean you see godliness? First of all, there's two reasons why we, what we mean by seeing godliness. One is physically. Physically? Yeah. It says in the Mishnah Perki Avos, <clears throat> made a copy on page 33. Asara Nisim There were 10 miracles that occurred constantly in the base of English. When a person sees a miracle with their eyes, you might not say that you saw Hashem, but you clearly saw a manifestation of Hashem with your own physical eyes. In other words, if a person is in a situation where you know, the doctor says, this person cannot live for more than three days, just giving you an example. And then you go to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe tells you to do this, that, and the other thing. And don't worry about what the doctor says. And the person wakes up, and two days later, they're fully well, and they're ready to walk outside. And the doctor goes, oh, I can't explain. This is just a miracle. It's a medical miracle. We don't, we don't understand it. it. It doesn't make any sense. What you really witnessed with your physical eyes was Hashem's presence. Because this couldn't happen according to the laws of nature. So even though I don't say that I can see uh, Hashem, but I, it's a physical, uh, it's a visual experience of godliness. Every time there's a miracle, and that's why a miracle has such a tremendous impact on people and changes people's lives very often when they have this kind of a miracle. In the base of English, there were 10 miracles on a constant basis, which means that Hashem's presence was revealed there in a way that yes, you could see something with your eyes 
which testifies Hashem's, Hashem's presence is here. <clears throat> That's number one. Number two, there's something going on subconscious, which means even if I don't see, just walking into the base of Migdash, the place that Hashem's presence is, is, is so revealed and so pronounced, the neshama definitely senses it and feels it. And a person walks in the basement, they're charged up with love and fear of Hashem, charged up with a greater feeling of amun and Hashem. And when you go back home and you're charged up with all these feelings, again, everything is at a higher level than it could have been possible with the other basement English. So when we ask a question, why was it so important to go to the base of Migdash to do this one mitzvah? You're losing so much time, you could have accomplished so much more. The answer is the quality of what I'm going to do could never ever come anywhere near the quality of what it is when I do it after going to the base of Migdash. So my davening is totally different. My learning is totally different. My mitzvahs are totally different. My Abbas Yisrael and Amuna and Zedaka, everything is totally different. And that's only as a result of going to the base of Migdash. <clears throat> Any questions? You follow this? Yes, hello, maybe somebody say, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. The presence of Hashem is not revealed as a juice, but it's still there in a way that's still different than the rest of the world. Yep. Now this is the source, this is the, the reason why Chassid didn't come to the Rebbe. So first of all, let me just show it to you inside as a halacha. There's a halacha brought down in the Rambam in the booklet, it's page 34. Where the Rambam writes these words, these are laws of how to relate to a Torah teacher. Look at the bottom of the page where it's underlined in the Hebrew. We should underline it in the English right now, where it says, Chayev Adam the Hagbil Rabbi Berego. A person is obligated to visit his teachings during the festivals. And on the bottom, you see the footnotes that the reason for that is because there's a mitzvah to go visit the way some English during the festivals is as well a mitzvah to visit your Rebbe during the festivals. In fact, it's interesting that we learn this from the way a woman at Sadek is conducting herself. You remember the story <clears throat> that there was a woman who was at Sadek and she used to uh, arrange accommodations for a Navi, Elisha. She had no children, he gave a bracha for a child and then the child passed away and she ran to the Navi. As she's running to the Navi, her husband says, and she didn't tell her husband what happened. The Navi says, where are you going? It's not Rosh Chodesh today, and it's not Yantav today. Why are you going to the Navi? So from this we learn that when it is uh, a Yantav, it's the right time to go to the Navi. Why? So, <clears throat> look at number six on the page. There's a word that's brought down in Chassidus. I think the source is Sefer Yetzirah, one of the major books of Kabbalah. And the word is Asha. Asha literally means smoke, but actually in this context, it's a, an acronym for three words, Oilam, Shana, and Nefesh, which is, Oilam means the world, in other words, the realm of space, Shana is time, the realm of time, and Nefesh is the realm of life. So it says in Sefer Yetzirah that Hashem created the world, that it's made up of three dimensions. And these are the three dimensions, life, time, and space. And all these three dimensions, Hashem created them in a way that they, they are parallel to each other, which means whatever he created in the realm of space, he created a similar structure that resembles it in the realm of time. And whatever is in the, in the realm of space and time is a similar structure in the realm of life. So therefore, regarding 
and in context of our conversation here, our discussion here, just like in the realm of space, there's a place in the world where Hashem's presence is there more than any place else, and from there it spreads to the rest of the world. The same is in the realm of time. There's certain uh, sort of <clears throat> units, certain segments of time that Hashem's presence is more revealed there, and from there it's revealed every day in the year. What are those times? Generally speaking, it's Shabbos and Yom Tif. But if you want to talk about the highest point, like the Beis Hamikdash or the Kodesh Hakadoshim, so that space and time is Yom Kippur. It's the high Hashem's presence is revealed the most than any other day of the year on Yom Kippur, and from there the presence of Hashem spreads to the entire realm of time. So the fact that I can sense Hashem's presence Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any day of the year is because Hashem's presence is there. That's true. But how does Hashem's presence come there? It goes through the same sort of process. First, it's in the Yom Kippur. From Yom Kippur, it spreads to all the Yom Tevim, Shabbos, and then to all the days of the week. And just like this exists in the realm of space and time, it ex exists in the realm of life. That Hashem's presence is found within every human being. Hashem's presence is found in every place where there is life. They have the animals also, not only humans. And it's there, but where does it all come from? There are certain places in the realm of life where Hashem's presence is more revealed. And from there, it spreads to all other um, areas in the realm of life, to all other people in the world, and to all animals in the world, and so on. And where is Hashem's presence in the realm of life more than any place else? Naturally, by tzaddikim. Those who are tzaddikim, they are righteous, which means their mind and their hearts and their hands and their mouth and their eyes and their ears are refined. And everything they do, everything they think, everything they say, all their thoughts, all their things that they look at and everything that comes from them and through them is completely and totally aligned with Hashem's will. Uh, they're like a walking base in Megdash and Hashem's presence is revealed in them. And not only it's revealed in them more than any other place in the world, but the same thing from them, it spreads to the rest of the world. So by traveling to a Rebbe in a certain way, of course, this is a discussion that needs much, much more details, but you're traveling to a Rebbe in a certain sense is the same idea as traveling to the Mason English. I'm going to a place where I'm going to see godliness in a more revealed way. And when I'm going to see godliness in a more revealed way, this will enhance my davening, my learning, my mitzvahs, my avisisro, my tzedakah. Everything I do will be upgraded in a way that without that, I could never have reached this level of consciousness of godliness. In other words, we don't necessarily travel to Rebbe, so I should know how to put on tefillin. Tefillin, mezuzah, Shabbos, kashrus, yontif, shefer, sukkah, lulav, all this we have a shulchan aruch, which guides us step by step, what to do, what not to do. The going to Rebbe is mainly for that additional awareness and consciousness of Hashem. In the language of the Alter Rebbe, there's a chapter in Tanya where the Alter Rebbe is, <coughs> uses these words, that the traveling to Rebbe is mainly to achieve three things. A greater awareness of love for Hashem, fear of Hashem, and amunah in Hashem. These three attributes, love, fear, and amunah. And these are the three things that they enhance everything. If a person has love for Hashem, fear of Hashem, and a deeper amunah in Hashem, then automatically all this Torah and all this mitzvahs, all the other 613 things in Torah mitzvahs will be on a much higher level. Rabbi, which chapter? Which what? Which parak in Tanya? Which parak in Tanya this is? It's in the fourth volume of Tanya, which is called the Geras HaKodesh. And this is in parak, and we call it Simen. Over there it's not called parak, we call it Simen. Simen Chav Zayin and Chav Ches. Those two. Over there, it's, it's, it's a, I'll get to you in a second. It's um, a letter that was sent to the students of Rabbi Mendel Hardaka who had passed away. The author ever talks about what one gains from coming to Rebbe. Yes, Tova. Um, what, what you were just saying about someone gains when they visit their Rebbe, it's 
So whenever they visit there, it's not only during these three times. These are just the three times a lot of people would come, but you could go in the middle of the summer and you still reap the same benefits. Right, right. right. In fact, every person had their time when they and everybody came to the Rebbe at the same time. People came to different times of the year. They came in times that were more suitable for them, or people chose times that resonated more with their neshama and with their ruchnis. The Pritikov writes in a letter to our Rebbe how every chassid had their time, and the chassidim used to refer to them by that. In other words, if there was someone that always came to the Rebbe Purim, they would call him, oh, he's a Purim de Kachasim. He comes Purim. And then he writes to the Rebbe, your grandfather, whose name is Baruch Schneer, he came to the Babich more often, but his main time in the year to come was Shvuz. And they referred to him as your Shvuz Dika. That was his time to be by the Rebbe. So I think it, some people maybe was technical. That's when they had off. That's when they can get away. But for most of the people, it was also Ruchnis. Like this was the time of the year that they felt it resonated with their neshama more. <clears throat> so this is what we went to the base of English for to get more avas Hashem, yiras Hashem, and amunas Hashem. And the same is with the union of traveling to a Rebbe. Again, it's always helpful when we see things in in Nigla, in the revealed part of Torah, in the halachic part of Torah, that sort of make this clear. So I just want to point to page thirty six. What was the holiest place in the Beis HaMikdash? The Kodesh HaKadoshim. And what was the holiest object in the Kodesh HaKadoshim? And in fact, the only object in the Kodesh HaKadoshim was the Oren and the Luchis, right? There was nothing else there. Oren and the Luchis. <clears throat> there were a few other little things that went along with it, but the main um, thing that was in the Kodesh HaKadoshim was the Oren and the Luchis. Here's a story in Medrash, page 36. I don't have a translation of this in English, so very easy to read Hebrew. Pamachas Nichas Rabbi Yeshua. It describes how there was a person who was the greatest Torah scholar of that generation, his name was Rabbi Lezer Agrogel. And one time Rabbi Yeshua went in to where he was teaching. In those days, he would sit on a rock because the rock is higher. Everyone could see him and he could see everybody else. He used to sit on a rock, and from that rock, he would teach Torah. Rabbi Shul walked in, the his, his eben. he began kissing the rock. Looks like not only kissed the rock, just kissed it numerous times out of love and affection. And he said, this rock, it's like the Har Sinai. And the one that sits on the rock, is like the Luchis, and the Oren that contained the Luchas in it. In other words, being that Rabbi Lezer, Hagadol, was the source of Torah of that generation, and this was the rock where he taught Torah from, so he was saying, in our generation, this is Har Sinai, and he is the source of Torah, which is the Ark and the Luchas that are in it. Comparing this Tzaddik to the Beis English. And of course, we know the famous Sikh of the Rebbe, which is called Beis Rabbeinu Shebebavo. And that it means the Gemara says that the, the, the shul of a, of a tzaddik, first of all, every shul is a miniature Beis HaMikdash. It means whatever the Beis HaMikdash accomplishes on a global level, every shul in their community accomplishes that on a smaller scale. Because the shul is the source also for fear of God and for davening and learning, shiurim, that's what people come that's where they get the spiritual inspiration. But yet there's one shul that that's the source globally, and that's the shul of the whoever is the leader of the generation. So this is the reason why Chesidim come to the Rebbe. Then comes the big question. Perfect. Just in time, we're ready to almost finish. How are everybody getting? What? How are everybody getting? No, that's also a question. That's a different question. You just don't eat for a few days before, <laughs> and then you have no problem getting in. The big question is, why are people coming now? Before, when you could see the Rebbe blowing Schaefer, you saw the Rebbe in Hakafas, you saw the Rebbe dancing by Napoleon's March, you saw the Rebbe doing Lulav and Esrog. All these things are watching it, 
instills and generates the fear of Hashem because you're watching a godly person doing Torah and mitzvahs and that generates all these things which we spoke about before. But now we don't see it. So why is this happening now? Oh, so this, how do we, where do we start? We're not going to be able to finish. So I'll just make a starting point and hopefully we do have a class this afternoon. So we'll continue in the afternoon. So one of the things that are uh, brought down in the Rebbe Sichas, in other words, just like we look to the Rebbe to know what should be our custom in, in when it comes to davening, Lulav and Esther, not everybody does Lulav and Esther the same way. The general mitzvah is done exactly the same by all Jews around the world. But there are differences. I don't know if you're aware of those differences. There are little differences in the way we do it, the way other people do it. A chassid is a person who follows his rebbe's path. So when it comes to something like this, the attachment to the rebbe, what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, how should we react to certain things, the place to look, like everything else, is to the rebbe. How did the rebbe react to his rebbe? How was the rebbe's his kashras to his rebbe? And those things help us understand how we should connect. So there's a story that the Rebbe um, speaks about, and this story is found in a mimer of the Friedrich Rebbe. And this is interesting because usually maimarim are not stories. That's in sichas. Maimarim usually, that's the difference. A mimer is usually pure chassidus. Nevertheless, you probably remember that the Rebbe's first mimer that he said, Bosaligani, actually had a few stories. There's one part of the mimer which is extremely deep. And the second part of the mimer is so simple. It's actually stories of the Alter Rebbe, the Mitra Rebbe, some of Sedi. Similarly, by the Friedrich Rebbe, the first mimer that he said when he took on leadership also was a deep mimer. But in the mimer, he had a story. And the story is in the mimer. And then later in the Sikha, he elaborated on it in more detail. And the story is that this happened when he was four or five years old. At that time, the Rebbe Marash, which means his grandfather, the fourth Rebbe of Chabad, was nostalgic. And, and, the, and uh, the, the Rebbe Rashab officially didn't become the Rebbe yet. He used to go, the Friedrich Rebbe says, I used to love to go to my grandfather's room and sit down on a chair and think over things that I heard in Cheder, in school. One of the things he loved to do was, when he heard stories, he would love to sit down and picture the story in his head and relive it, so to speak, as if it was real. And he had, he developed this talent that when he hears a story, he could lay the picture in his head so vividly, it's as if it's mamish happening. And he writes, in a mimer, and that's here in the book, on the page 38, if you want to follow it, that one time, I, um, it doesn't say the details here, but in the Sikha, it gives the details. He was in Cheder, and he heard the story from his teacher that Rabbi Yudha Hanasi, after his passing, used to come back to his family and sit by the table every Friday night. When I heard that, I went to my grandfather's room. I sat down on a chair, closed my eyes, and I was picturing Rabbi Yudha Hanasi, imagine, he passed away, and his family sitting by the table, and Shalom Aleichem, he walks in, and he sits down by the table, and he makes Kiddush, as if nothing ever happened. And he's imagining it. And as I'm sitting and thinking, with my eyes closed, I hear noise. I open my eyes, and I see my father, the Rebbe Rashad, standing in front of my grandfather's desk, because the grandfather's room, that's where he accepted people, the Yechidus. So the chair was there, the table was there, the furniture wasn't moved, wasn't touched. And my father is standing with his Shabbos clothing, with his garto, holding a piece of paper in his hand, reading from it. Tears are flowing from his eyes, and he's facing the chair. And I got so frightened, because he was just thinking about the idea that Rabbi Yonasi comes back to the same place where he was before. And he saw openly how his father is sitting and talking to his father, facing the chair. And I tipped him quietly and ran out of the room. That's the story that he tells. And basically, on this, what he's saying in this story is that there are tzaddikim, that even after their presence, they're here. And where are they in the same place where they were during their lifetime? And that applies to 770. 
And to understand that better, stay till this afternoon, because it's already oh, past, uh, past our time. To be continued. Yeah. Let me be a good time to talk about it. Let me teach the other class now. So if you come down at 10, we'll make a time. Okay.